Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here with Evan Brand. Evan, how are we doing today, man? Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you, the best day of the week. Uh, we've got a short limited time, but we wanted to dive in and chat about gut infections and how this can affect mental health. We test everyone's gut. We run a stool test on everyone, organic acids testing on everyone or nearly everyone as much as possible because there's a lot of different markers that conventional doctors are never going to test. Therefore, you're never going to know what's going on unless you can get these specific functional medicine testing run. And one thing that we see a lot of is clostridia. And so you and I were reviewing a little bit of the literature before we jumped on here that the clostridia bacteria, oftentimes people are going to know about C. diff. You'll hear about clostridia difficile or C. diff very commonly spread in like nursing homes and hospitals. A lot of times it's causing diarrhea and there's actually people dying of this because it's actually become antibiotic resistant. So if you get con if you get a conventional doctor to diagnose and treat you for C. diff, it's going to be antibiotics. But the problem is these antibiotics are working very, very minimally. You know, they're working. I don't have a statistic, but it's not often that, that they work. And then they come in with a second or a third or a fourth round of antibiotic and they still can't get rid of it. And the things that we use, whether it's silver or oregano or garlic or berberines and barberries and bearberries, there's so many different natural antibiotics out there that we can use. And people don't talk about this. So that's why we're here to talk about it. And one of the biggest things that predisposes people for C. diff, Clostridium difficile, is antibiotic exposure. I mean, I have one uh, journal article basically talking about the cumulative antibiotic exposure is the biggest risk factor for Clostridium difficile infection, CDI. So again, we know antibiotics are used kind of like candy in the conventional medical community. So, you know, the big thing that we're trying to do is like, one, let's always try to do natural herbal botanicals first, because number one, they have a lot of antioxidants to them. Number two, they tend to have effects that inhibit the reflux or the efflux pumps. And these efflux pumps are, imagine a canoe with a hole in it. And imagine you're sitting in the canoe, you're bailing out water, right? As water comes in through the hole, you're bailing out water back out into the ocean. That's that's kind of what efflux pumps do. The hole in the canoe is the antimicrobial or the antibiotics coming in, and then the efflux pumps are bailing that water out. So the benefit that we have with the efflux pumps or the benefit that we have with the natural antimicrobials is we don't have that, that pail bailing out the water. We don't have the critters bailing out the water so it can take on water faster and we can essentially uh, sink the uh, canoe, so to speak. That's crazy. Well, let's chat about the brain a bit. So there's a lot of complicated uh, neurochemistry involved, and we'll keep it as simple as possible. If you just Google for yourself, Clostridia brain chemistry or Clostridia HPHPA, this is something that you can find, this picture. And what happens is normally your neurotransmitters like tyrosine are supposed to get converted into dopa, then into dopamine. But what happens is when we pull up your stool test and your organic acids, if we see that you've got elevated HPHPA, that's an organic acid that'll show high on an oat test, a urine test. If you have this bacterial infection, what happens is your tyrosine doesn't get converted into the dopamine like it's supposed to because there's an enzyme. And Justin, maybe you can clear this up too if I'm, if I'm interpreting this wrong. But these Clostridia species, they create an enzyme it's called dopamine beta hydroxylase that causes the dopamine not to break down properly. So then all of a sudden you've got aggression and rage and irritability and schizophrenia and autism and all these other things that show up because this enzyme is cranked up due to the bacterial, inf <clears throat> due to the bacterial infection, then you have excess dopamine, then you go crazy. Is that how you interpret that whole cycle? Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at the, um, the the cycle, right? So we have phenylalanine, which comes from tyrosine, and then phenylalanine can go down into these various clostridium difficile metabolites. And then from there, that dopamine hydroxy, the dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme helps convert it downstream. And then from there, it can also go into norepinephrine as well. So again, that's important because any type of gut affect enzymes in the body, which can affect neurotransmitter conversion. But number two, clostridium difficile also causes a lot of digestive issues, especially diarrhea. 
So we know that if there's diarrhea happening, that there's a good chance that we're not going to be able to break down, assimilate, utilize, and absorb a lot of the nutrients that we're taking in our uh, body through our diet and supplementation. So that may also create more issues because then we have less building blocks. So I definitely see being a two-way street, some of these enzymes may affect optimal conversion of dopamine in the brain. Because remember, dopamine can't cross the blood-brain barrier, right? A lot of these amino acids do, and then these amino acids get converted locally in the brain. And then we also have the absorption component as well, which is really important. Yep. So if you've got mood issues, a lot of times you're going to have gut issues at the same time. When I had parasites, I had H. pylori, I had bacterial overgrowth. I didn't have C. diff luckily, but I had other species. My moods were were not good. And even though I had done the paleo diet for a long time, 80% of symptoms were better, but I didn't get that final 20% symptom improvement until I fixed the gut. And clostridia is just one of those things that show up. You mentioned other bacterial overgrowth. A lot of times we're not going to see clostridia in a vacuum. We may see candida. We may see mold. We may see fungus or fungal toxins. We may see parasites. We may see H. pylori, which is another type of bacterial infection that suppresses stomach acid. And this thing can get out of control. So if you do have gut symptoms or you do have mood symptoms, whether it's like aggression, irritability, you feel like your fuse is shorter than it should be. Of course, there's a factor in adrenals. There's a, a liver component to this. There's a thyroid component we could probably chat about. But really, the, the take-home message is you've got to get tested for this. And I, I've seen a lot of false negatives too, and maybe you can speak on this, that a conventional testing that is not as sensitive as what we're using can miss these infections. Can you speak on that? Well, again, the GM app testing that we use, we also look at C. diff, the toxin A and the toxin B. These are various toxins produced by these critters. And if you have both of them, A and B, the, you know, that's going to be, uh, means you have a, a more virulent infection and you need to get treatment ASAP for that. But you may just have one toxin over the other, A versus B or B versus A. So that can give us a pretty good window of what's happening. And, you know, we have the Clostridium difficile species. There are other species of Clostridia as well. So on these testing, we'll see other species that are there, but we really want to look for the various toxins that are present as well, because that's going to really cause a lot of the issues. And in conventional medicine, they're typically using like vancomycin to treat it. In the natural medicine world, you know, we can use berberines, we can use antimicrobial botanicals, right? There's also a specific probiotics we can use like Saccharomyces boulardii and specific lactobacillus species like the lactobacillus rhamnosus species. Now, in the probiotics that we use, like in my probioflora, right, we have the rhamnosus and the, and the lactobacillus all in there together. And we'll typically also hit it with very high dose Saccharomyces boulardii as well. But even before that, even before we get to step five in that six hour protocol, first hour, remove bad food, second hour, replace enzymes, acids, Third R is going to be repair the gut lining and the hormones. Fourth R is removing the infection. So we work on the fourth R using a lot of the herbal botanicals to help remove the infection. Fifth R, we work on repopulation. So again, we hit it in a lot of different steps to make sure we can knock it out fully. We don't just rely on one antibiotic because we do know that one of the biggest risk, risk factors for Clostridium difficile infection is cumulative antibiotic exposure according to literature, right? Yep. Yep. Well said. Let's chat about protection a little bit. I mean, let's say that you have to go visit a friend or a family member in a nursing home or a hospital. What could you do to maybe prevent yourself from picking this up? Because this clostridia can be airborne. I mean, are you talking like I've heard some people spraying silver like around their nose, their ears, their mouth, just trying to have like a general barrier? I mean, putting on a face mask, like what do you do? How do you prevent yourself from picking this infection up? Or at least how do you reduce your risk? Well, number one, um, a lot of it's going to be spread in the in the in the bathroom, right? Because people have a bowel movement. There's particulate. Maybe they don't flush, and they can aerosolize out of the toilet seat. Oh, right? gross! So, of course, keeping the toilet seat closed, those kind of things. Ideally, you know, trying to avoid a lot of public restrooms when you have to to utilize a bowel movement, or at least just make sure, um, you know, it's fully flushed, right? Fully flushed, all that stuff, and um, you do your best with that. But you know what's crazy? Saying. The most of the public bathrooms, they don't have lids on their toilet seats. So you just think of all these hundreds of people going in a public bathroom. There's usually not a toilet seat. They flush it. That stuff's going everywhere. Have you seen those studies where they've used like, uh, I don't know if it was a thermal imaging camera or like a UV camera or a black light and they can see like the fecal matter is like 10 feet away from the toilet. Have you seen those videos? I've not seen that. I think it's got to be getting better today because a lot of the um, toilets kind of flush automatically. 
Yeah. So there is that benefit, right? As soon as someone gets off the seat, it flushes within a few seconds. So True. Yeah, that's, that's better than someone just letting it sit there for a long period of time. Of course, you know, physical contamination is going to be the big one. So just touching stuff and not washing your hands. I think it's good to have one of those. Um, I think it's EO. EO makes one that you can get them at Whole Foods. They're kind of like a, a alcohol, herbal, essential yeah. oil kind of rub. You can get the spray or the gel. So I think it's good. Like once you're out, like just kind of do that, you know, use a little bit of that gel or that spray as well. Just because now you're out, you haven't touched anything and that gives you a good chance of knocking that stuff down. So I have no problem with that. That's going to help significantly. Just yeah. Get contact component that then. Yep, good advice. Because if you've got it on your hands then maybe you scratch your nose or you touch your face or something and then you get it into the bloodstream. Exactly. And of course, just having a stronger immune system, right? A lot of these things happen when you're immunocompromised. So when you have poor diet, when you have poor stress, when you have poor sleep, when you already have a compromised gut issue, these things can happen. So they very rarely happen just out of isolation. Um, you may have other infections and then the C. diff is an issue. You may have other infections that came about because of chronic antibiotic use because antibiotics then cause rebound overgrowth as well. Or if you're using antibiotics, I don't know, like an H. pylori infection, you're doing triple therapy, right? A lot of the other um, things that are also used outside of ankylomycin are going to be proton pump inhibitors, right? But what does that create? Low stomach acid environment, that's going to set you up to not break down proteins, be able to break down fats and ionize minerals. So that creates more problems down the road, right? Yeah, well said. So if you're on an acid blocker, this conversation should perk your ears up a little bit. Pay attention because you're at a higher risk for these infections. We see it every single week between us both. We've seen thousands and thousands of gut bugs. So uh, acid blockers or uh, also birth control pills too. We know that can affect the gut microbiome a bit and also um, yeast infections too. So if women have had yeast infections, they're going to get put on like a Diflucan or a nice statin or some other pharmaceutical that could also change the microbial balance and you get clostridia that way. So basically any intervention that's knocked out the good guys is going to put you at risk. You're saying 100% and just stay out of hospitals, really just stay out of, you know, conventional hospitals. I mean, if your family member really gets sick and you have to go totally get it right. But if you have the ability to wait till someone's out of the hospital, wait till they're out. Yeah, I mean, my wife, um, her mom was in the hospital, uh, what was it, maybe a month ago. She had a lung nodule. They couldn't figure out if it was cancerous or not, so they just took her in anyway and did like a lung nodule surgery. And my wife wanted to go into the hospital, but I was like, with the baby, we just can't chance it. So she told her mom, hey, look, we're just going to wait it out. And it only took an extra day or two for her to get home. Nobody's feelings were hurt. And she still got to visit her outside of the hospital environment. I mean, the last thing we wanted was my wife bringing home some type of bug and getting the baby sick, you know, so we just didn't take a chance. Oh, totally. And if someone's in the hospital because of, you know, severe reasons, right? Of course you want to go, right? But yeah. if it's like a severe life and death kind of thing, you know, try to utilize Fa FaceTime or Skype on your smartphone. That's a good way of connecting because that's the biggest thing is being in hospitals and getting antibiotic exposure. And guess what? Guess who the people that get the most antibiotic exposure are? Who? They're hospitals, right? They're in hospitals. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Sure. And that's usually people that are sick and they're coming into the ER or coming in, right? Because the more chronically they're coming in, typically more antibiotics are prescribed because, well, that's really the biggest thing that, you know, conventional medicine has are people that are sick. I know IVs right. too, IV antibiotics. I mean, that's just, I can't believe how often that's dispensed and distributed. It's kind of scary. A hundred percent. So in general, like we look at this from a functional medicine perspective, we can kind of like zoom in on one type of thing here, which is C. diff. But when we we're looking at things, we're looking at the whole picture. So C. diff may be a part of your clinical picture. If you have diarrhea or digestive issues or have leaky gut, so you may be saying, is C. diff an issue? It may be, but it may also be a combination of C. diff, H. pylori and blastocystis hominis. So you, everyone has the right to have more than one issue going on at the same time. So Agreed. just kind of keep that, you know, in the back of your head. A lot of these issues aren't binary. They aren't on off, you know, one or the other. You can have multiple different things happening. And of course, the longer these gut issues are present, the more there's a, an absorption or a bottleneck of nutrients getting into your system. That's going to affect your neurotransmitters. That's going to affect your adrenals. Also potentially affect your thyroid if you're not maximally absorbing selenium or iodine or copper. And then we know with the whole... um 
with the whole neurotransmitter thing in dopamine, right? We look at the HPA, HPA, B6 is very important for dopamine metabolism. And if we have dysbiotic bacterial overgrowth, that internal production of B vitamins is going to be down and we may not quite be able to absorb the B vitamins in our diet, partly because of the increased transit time, right? Yeah. When there's toxicity and inflammation in the gut, your colon and your intestines soak up a lot of water. Why? It's doing it to dilute the the infectious debris so it can flush it out. It's diluting it and then flushing it out. But what also diluted and flushed out is also going to be all of these micronutrients that are in your intestines that may have not had enough time to assimilate, as, absorb, and be utilized yet. Yep, well said. And then we'll give a mention here to fecal transplants. I mean, this is still kind of an ex, uh, a, a, I would say experiment slash ex, uh, I can't even say the word, Justin. What is it? Experimental therapy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm seeing people that are getting fecal transplants, and there is cool literature that after one, if not two, maybe three at the most fecal transplants where you're taking stool from a donor that does not have C. diff. You're transplanting that with a capsule of usually a very, very deep frozen stool, very, very cold frozen stool in a capsule form. The C. diff infected patient swallows that. Then within one, two, or at the most three fecal transplants, the success rate is over 95% of curing C. diff. The only thing is I'm having people that are saying they're getting personality changes and that they're starting to have a different preference for music and that they're craving fast food when they never craved fast food and that they've gained weight or they've lost weight because we're finding out that these gut bacteria are very unique. And you could take somebody's gut bacteria from an obese person that doesn't have C. diff, put it into your you who's a skinny person, and all of a sudden you get obese. And it's because you took someone else's microbiome and put it into your gut. So I think it's a absolute last resort and a lot of the antimicrobials and protocols that you and I use for parasites and other bugs, we're going to kill C. diff in the process of that. So if that were unsuccessful, maybe fecal transplants necessary, but man, I don't really want to change my personality or become obese because I took my bacteria from someone that, that had a, a personality that I didn't like or something. I mean, that just sounds, that sounds crazy to me. Yeah. And again, when you do a fecal implant, you know, it, it's going to have effects that aren't going to be potentially forever because when you put bacteria in your gut, it tends to be more transient and pass through, you okay. know, kind of the microbiome that you have in the beginning is kind of what you have. You can influence it and nudge it in the direction. And a lot of these things tend to be more transient. That's why, you know, you can't just take a probiotic once and then get the benefit forever. You're taking it, but then you're also maybe getting fermented foods in your diet, those kind of things to alter it. Maybe you're taking some probiotics, a bottle of it every quarter or so once you're doing really well and you're getting fermented food in daily. But again, I look at like a fecal implant as kind of like a palliative thing. Yeah. So if I'm seeing an improvement with symptoms and we're able to knock the infection down without having to do a whole bunch of antibiotics, I think it's beneficial. My thing is if you have C. diff and a whole bunch of other infections and you're still eating poorly or you have other food allergens in there that are causing leaky gut, I see the fecal transplant is kind of like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, so to speak. It's just not quite fixing yeah. the root cause. Better than antibiotics, in my opinion. So we'll have to just keep an eye on it and see how these things are are looking in the literature. It's the same thing with a lot of these docs that are using the helminth or worm therapy, right? Um, they're using worms and stuff to kind of modulate the immune system. I see a lot of that as being palliative, right? If not, we'd see people in third world countries that have lots of parasitic infections and worms, you know, have super robust health, right? Obviously, they're also malnourished and have really poor water supply, but I can't imagine an infection driving and improving someone's health. I, I just, that Agreed. for me, I just have a hard time wrapping my head around it. I think it can push the immune system in one way or the other. And because let's say your immune system was on this side, maybe more TH2, and now you push it more TH1 by giving a helmet or a worm, that that can shift the immune system more to equilibrium and you feel better. I don't think it's still the root cause, but I, in my mind, I always like kind of look at things. Okay, we have palliative therapies that just fix symptoms. And then we have palliative therapies that are more natural with less side effects, right? Like, so like think of a headache, right? Palliative for headache. What's that? Magnesium, Advil. curcumin, right? Well, palliative that's natural, oh, less okay. side effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Curcumin, uh, magnesium, B6, right? The various, you know, rosemary, ginger, right? Natural palliative things without side effects. And then the other side, we have ibuprofen that kills 20,000 people a year taken properly. Yep. So I look at like, 
palliative, and then what's the risk reward on those palliative things? So I kind of put the fecal transplant more on the safer side versus like some of these other medications that kill people taken properly. So we got a palliative safe, palliative unsafe, risk reward, and then also what's the root cause. So in functional medicine, we always delineate all three of those. Yep. Well said. Well said. Uh, I think we could probably make this conversation longer, but since we're out of time today, I think that was sufficient. You've got to get the diet dialed in. When we're talking to you guys, we're always assuming you're following something like a paleo template, organic pasture raised meats, organic veggies, high quality berries, maybe some nuts and seeds. If you're not on an AIP diet and you can tolerate those, you're getting to bed on time. You're getting up with the sun. You're getting exercise, adequate hydration, no sodas, no, you know, fake fructose in the diet. You're not skipping meals. You're getting your adrenals checked out, your thyroid, and then you're jumping into this conversation. So that's all the prerequisites required to, to have on board before you really start diving into a gut protocol. So uh, if you want to learn more, we've got hundreds of hours of content on this. Keep looking around. Go on Justin's site, his personal site and blog, where you can also sign up for functional medicine consults. That's Justin Health. Dot com and if you'd like to reach out schedule a consult with me you could do the same thing at evanbrand.com and make sure you hit subscribe on justin's channel here keep the tribe growing and hit the bell you'll get the notifications and we're going to be back with you guys next monday around the same time so stay tuned for more absolutely and just remember top symptoms for c diff are going to be watery diarrhea fever loss of appetite uh, belly pain, nausea. These are all symptoms of other kind of infections too. So, you know, it's easy for people to, to read about one thing and say, this is me, right? You see it a lot with Lyme, Lyme disease, those kind of things. So you keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, washing with hands and soap <clears throat> tends to be more effective than just using alcohol. Keep that in the back of your mind. If you're visiting someone in the hospital, you know, wear the full gown, get up. You know, that's the same kind of gown that they would wear. People have MRSA, wear that get up as well. So if you're going to see someone, you know, that's an extra, extra, of protection as well on top of that. Anything else you want to add there, Evan? I think that's it. Get yourself tested. Like I said, reach out to one of us if you need to get some functional medicine stool testing or organic acids testing done. We look for this. We see it thousands of times a year, but there are natural solutions. So keep digging. Don't give up. And we'll talk with you guys next week. Absolutely. And then anyone that's asking questions here, try to keep it on topic. If you're going off the deep end and talking about things that we're not chatting about, save that for my daily FAQs. Um, that way I can answer you there. I may do one today. So look, I'll try to put it up in the YouTube queue so you guys can be aware of it. And someone writes in about eosinophilic gastroenteritis that could either be from severe food allergies or from other parasites. Allergies and parasites can increase eosinophils. So keep that in the back of your mind. Hey, Evan, phenomenal chat today. We'll be right back here. I'm going to do a video in a bit. I'll post it up on YouTube later on today, and I may be back later on for a live FAQ. So stay tuned. If not, Friday mornings are going to be when I do that, but look later on today. Evan, phenomenal chat, man. We'll talk real soon. Take care. Bye. Have a great Monday. Bye.